Uh, I'd like to introduce Joseph Curtin and uh, very much look forward to uh, your presentation. Thank you so much, Peter, for arranging this and, and, and Tony too. Um, is my sound okay? Can people hear me clearly? Um, I can hear you. You're 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 you're, you're maybe five percent on the softer side than louder, but I can hear what you're saying. Okay, is that better when I'm closer? Uh, yes. Okay, so um, I'm talking about um, next next sets today, not really from a practical how to do it point of view, but rather from a evolutionary one. I've um, I've never much been interested in the history of violin in the normal sense of um, who made what, when, and, and who they studied with. But the, I'm, I'm quite captivated by the, what I'd call the, the structural history of the instrument, who designed what, when, and, how, and what did the design show about how much people understood. Um, the usual history of the violin, I think, has sort of been this, you know, came out of nowhere in the early 1500s, ascended to perfection with Stradiguinary, and then sort of dived downhill for a couple hundred years, and then we're trying to put, put it back um, um, bring things back up somehow. Um, but if, if I think if you look at it a bit more objectively from a sort of structure and engineering point of view, you see that some things really did come to perfection very early. The outline in particular, it's amazing, early Gasparo violins really mirror what Guarneri was doing. And, and the rest was really tweaking. I'd say that the archings um, were optimized for what we, for the way we use violins now, certainly with, with Guarneri and Stradivari. Um, but everything else, it's, it strikes me, has been been changing. The, the innovation sort of went inside with the bass bar and then the, the detail. It was really the setup that kept changing. And I think the, the next set um, kind of lagged behind everything. Um, I, I've got some slides, so I'm going to try and share my screen now. Give me a moment. Okay, the host disabled participant screen sharing. So could the host let me share? All right, you should be. Uh, there we go. Okay. Good. Um, you know, I could somehow. Okay, here we go. So, um, um, I don't really know much about um, Baroque instruments, and a lot of what I've learned c comes from. Roger Hargrave's thinking. Um, Evolutionary Road was, I think, a pair of articles he did in the Strad. And I thought he did a good job of capturing the forces that that moved making a hand, making ahead why they set the next the way they did, that it was it was relatively quick and it allowed the the next set to be sort of wiggled around after it was all together. And then um, I like his his notion that it faded and was replaced by the modern because. It was just too hard to reset. That makes good sense to me as, as a you know as a workshop person. Um, it, in fact, it's a nightmare to reset them. Apparently, getting the nails out. Um, so, evidently, when they started doing it, of course, they they weren't really um, concerned with that so much. Um, but I think they learned. But what um, strikes me, I, I got some slides from uh, mostly the um, from the museum in um, what's it called um, Vermilion. And um, looking at, this is 1595 Amati, I look at it and I say, what? Um, it, it seems astonishing that um, someone as sophisticated as Amati would, would, would do this. Maybe this is a new fingerboard, I don't know, but just this sort of cut here where if you took off the fingerboard, it's, it's, it's likely to split away the neck. It just doesn't seem like good engineering. Um, what, did he do this often? Is this entirely original? I, I don't know. But um, it strikes me from looking at these, this is a, um, an Amati from 1613. Um, again, it all looks very provisional. There we start to see this the curved underside, which we don't see anymore, and this sort of beginnings of this nick. Um, and 
is that a little is that a little shim put in to move the neck back? I don't know. They evidently taking care not to cut into the um, top, not to especially not to cut through the purfling. And this is that same one from the side view. And of course, what looks like a, a very clunky neck um, from our point of view would have not not necessarily felt so to someone who is playing mostly in you know first, second, third positions. Um, this is a, a, a tenor a viola, again, Amati, 1664. And again, this is another idea. Um, is this his workmanship? Was it really this rough, considering how refined he was elsewise? It's sort of carved back in there. Um, it, it's a different. It, it's a different look. Again, to me, it looks improvised. And now Montegazza was later, and he had a lot to do. I understand with the tra transition, and this is where you see you sort of see a neater with uh, you know more definitive um, transition there. But again, you um, you can see that they really didn't go into the top, and, and indeed they stopped the purfling underneath. Which, looking back now, um, has some structural advantages. You don't get the cracks there, which we, um, which plague um, later instruments or instruments with later setup. The same instrument from another point of view. And clearly, it's a veneered fingerboard. It looks like in two pieces the side. And then, this is the Harrison Strad with a with a modern set um, using the old neck, and it's it's sort of. Um, Kind of a sigh of relief when you just get rid of all this improvising and put a straight mortise and it's pretty much um of course stayed this way ever since um it's probably i don't know which is trickier to do a baroque set neck set or a modern neck set it depends how fast you are and how used you are to doing it but our modern set is relatively efficient you can do it in a few hours and you can um, be relatively precise about it the problem is when the neck inevitably um, sinks. Redoing it is manageable, but it's a big job, and you can pay thousands of dollars apparently um, it, for shops in New York to reset a neck. Um, so this is, but better or worse, this is the next set we all use. Um, what could be improved, if if anything? Are there parts of the design that that could evolve a little further? Um, well, there's a few obvious things. I think um, David Burgess probably 20, 30 years ago pointed out or he was the first person I hear point out that the, the um, heel um, will kind of flex and, and distort over the long run and become a curve there. And that if we reinforce it, that could help stop neck sinking. Um, he used uh, a, um, uh, a dowel with the, end grain, with the grain going contrary to the, the grain of the neck. Um, um, I used dowels. Um, and then switch to splines, um, mainly because there's a lot more gluing area. Dowels over time tend to distort and and um, not really be a, a do a good job. And I think splines are are more reliable. How thick it is depends on how how much help you think it needs. This is a relatively thick hard maple spline, um, and it's if anything overkill. That I'm quite confident that this isn't going to distort. The other thing that can distort is of course the the neck itself. Um, and in recent years, I've been doing this. We've been doing this at the shop. Um, now, um, I know Sam Zygmuntovich's shops and people out of there, Colin Gallagher, Ryan Soltis, were putting carbon fiber into the neck. Um, Ryan uses carbon fiber arrowheads. And um, I think um, Colin uses strips of graphite. Strips make the most sense to me. Why put them there at all? Well, you do see when necks is sunk, sometimes the neck is warped. Why would the neck warp? I think it's because it's curly maple rather than plain. The, the, the curly makes it much more flexible along its length. And so um, that can create problems. But with, with, with the a graphite fiber strip, I think that that's not going to happen. Lately, we've been exploring using sauna wood, which is a compressed wood that's um, better in some ways. It's, it's, it's greener, certainly, than carbon fiber. Um, I don't know that it's it's cheaper because the supply isn't supply chains are a bit are a bit sketchy right now. But it's nice. You can glue it with regular glue, um, and you can plane it as normal. With graphite, I usually submerge it, you know, half a millimeter below the the surface, so it's not actually. If there's any differential shrinkage, it's not going to push the fingerboard off. 
Um, so um, the only other thing that I can think about has to do the engineer of the, of the fingerboard, if you're looking from the player's point of view, especially now that there's a lot of players with small hands, young, very young people, young Asian women, for example, um, um, and they want the neck very thin, but then when you get in high positions, you start falling off on the E string side because it's essentially downhill to your fingers. The G is not so much your problem because your fingers are tending to push it uphill. So I thought, why not widen the neck, um, widen the fingerboard rather in the high positions. And um, I've actually, it's been doing it for a couple of years now, we've been doing various types. This, um, what you wanna do is have it so that when the player is going up, they don't feel a bump. And so this is engineered. So you really don't feel it. In fact, number of players who've tried it, they didn't know anything was there until I mentioned it. And that's good. You don't want people to notice things right away. But on balance, it, the, 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 the reviews have been positive. Um, as for the, the curved underside here, underside here, that's that's more for me for, for fun or my idea of fun. I'm trying to resolve some of the issues that were presented by the Baroque aesthetics, which I really don't think they solved. And for me, this is one way of resolving it, having this kind of um, engineered curve underneath rather than a straight line. And um, so that's, it's really for fun. It doesn't help the, the structure. Um, so that's how it looks on, a, on an instrument. Um, now, the, dis, the only disadvantage to this, well, two disadvantages. One, it's harder to make. And, and secondly, it, it wouldn't be obvious to someone just how to take it off and repair it. But um, sometimes you just say, um, so what? And this also de so depends on being able to use a, um, um, a CNC mill, and which I have had for some years now. And, and my assistants, um, Lonnie Marino and Alex Curran, I'm, I mean, we, we all work together as a, a team and brainstorm a lot on how to do these sort of things. And I should say that this and all the nexus I'm talking about are the result of endless tries. Um, you change anything with the violin, as I'm sure you all know, and you get unintended consequences. And trying to change something like the neck set or the F hole or anything, you have an idea and then you try it and something way down the line doesn't work out. So you go back to the, 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 the drawing board. I say that one of the fun things about trying to innovate is it makes you respect um, the original historical solutions a lot more. In most cases, I think there are some, some, some weaknesses that that's, can still be addressed. And um, the next set, I think, is maybe one of them. Um, now, I'm, of course, not the first person to think about adjustable next at all. And you can go search patents and find patents about it. The first one that I saw that Im impressed me as um, really 100% successful was Jim Ham's. Um, he's a bass maker in, in Victoria and Canada. And um, this was, I think, um, um, the, a bass, the, I, think the, I think it's the one that belongs to Gary Carr, a fantastic um, bass player. Um, now this has what I call a sliding heel approach. There's really two ways you can adjust the neck, neck angle. One of them is to slide the whole thing up and down. So essentially the overstand's increasing. And to do that, you loosen it here and then turn the screw. And he's engineered it so cleverly that um, you can, the player can um, play the instrument, adjust the string heights, and he'll still be in tune. And that's, that's impressive if you start looking at the geometry required. And I saw a demo of this, it was, it was lovely. Um, the, the, what I'm, um, one thing about this is it's not obvious to someone coming along, if you get this instrument comes into your shop, it's not transparent, by which I mean it's not obvious how it works. You can kind of figure it out, but I don't know how easy it would be to take the neck out. And in adjusting, in, in designing adjustable necks, it's, it really has become an important consideration for me. Well, what are my colleagues going to think? Well, probably a good 50% will think I'm, um, um, well, let's be charitable that I'm, <laughs> I've, got, I've got off the main course and it's a distraction. But um, perhaps others will say, OK, the, how does this work, and and is it is it is it plausible? So it's what I call transparency. Um, another neck, which is what I call it, completely transparent, is from um, the the French maker. Oh my God, I don't have that name handy. I think it's um, Michel Chevron, something like that. Um, and there, the mechanism is is uh, is one hundred percent visible. Um, now, in this case, it's the other approach, what I call the the tilting heel, where the angle 
the angle changes much as it does when we reset a neck. And in this case, this is a, a traveling base, um, the, the, the B-21, oh, excuse me, Patrick Chardin. I can't see the top of my screen because of all these um, zoom artifacts at the top, but yeah, Patrick Chardin. As a travel base, you can actually take it apart and um, pack it away without in a smaller, a smaller case. Um, um, this was a um, adjustable neck, which works um, I, I made this, I think, in 1997 or 98, um, around the time that Jim Ham was developing his, and it's actually a similar, but by coincidence, a similar principle where um, this slides up and down. It's not nearly as sophisticated as, as Jim's. Um, but let me just show you how it works. Um, well, so from the back view, you see um, the button. One of the biggest problems in adjustable neck idea is, well, what do you do with the button? You can try and bend over backwards and make it look like a normal button. Um, there's a adjustable neck by the German maker, Martin Schleske, where it just looks normal, except for the purfling. The purfling in the, in the button area has some springy material rubber in it, and so it compresses there. So you, you can make things look normal. I prefer just make them look different. Um, and in this case, um, well, you can see what it looks like. Um, and it's um, fairly simple in its construction. There's a mortise there, and there's a, um, a hole in it, enough for a screw to slide up and down. That's what the end of the neck block looks like. Um, there's a, it's, um, well, there's a, this is maple set in like a spline. There is an ebony cap there, and this is um, just a, something to fit into that groove and keep it in alignment. And then the um, screw would go, no, th no, there's a threaded insert there, inside there, excuse me. So from the inside, um, it basically screws in place. You can loosen it, raise it, loosen it, um, tighten it again. Now, uh, there's, um, there's things I like about this design, but it was, it was a, um, really um, wrong-headed. The idea that you have to unstring it to adjust the neck um, doesn't make sense. And you need a special tool that goes in through the end pin hole to do it, all because I didn't want it to show on the other side. I didn't want a screw hole in, in the neck. Um, again, there's this, often a sense, the violin world's so traditional that you often want to hide things. And um, this did effectively hide it, but at the cost of making it almost unusable. I had maybe five or four or five of these out that were sold, and they did fine, except and they came into a shop and someone wanted to know, well, how do I actually raise the neck? And, you know, I'd have to send them a special long Allen key. And it was a pain. And I finally actually um, got all of those back, I believe, and installed them as <laughs> with traditional neck sets. So that was a learning experience for me. Um, um, but um, it was fun doing. Um, so this one was about, I don't know, eight or nine, five, six years ago. I can't remember. Um, this was a, a very simple tilting neck approach rather than a, a sliding one. It's basically, if, if you think it takes three points to define a plane and where um, this, these are two screws that can be screwed out. Um, so depending on what position they are, that affects the side to side tilt of the neck. And then a screw going here would determine the angle. And all that's required is that this is put against a hard surface. So in the mortise, I'd put a um, a corresponding little metal part, or a, I can't remember what I did. I had probably a little brass insert. And I used this on a number of prototype um, instruments, what I call ultralight instruments. And it actually works really well. Um, it, it has been, there's one of them still out there. I'm, I'm, um, it, it, it actually is rock solid. The, the only thing against it is when you loosen the strings, it kind of goes floppy. and that, and I'm afraid of someone changing strings and it's sort of flopping around and somehow it doesn't, it doesn't feel right. Um, but then what is fun, as soon as you tighten the strings, it all sort of locks together and, and feels, feels great. Um, another thing that, that bothers me a little was that in order to change the side to side angle, in other words, to make sure it's heading straight down the instrument, you have to take it off and put it back on. That doesn't seem like a big deal, but I don't know. Um, once you start getting the feel of something that's way more convenient, um, you know, you start to want more. It's like you have a computer that takes 
or one second to process something and that used to take hours, but pretty soon you want it in half a second or a thousandth of a second. I think it's, I, I get that same feeling with innovations. Once you have a little taste of a solution of the problem, then you want an ever better solution. So um, this I, I put aside for a while. And then in, in recent years, um, it, it came up with, um, I think a combination of all of these, which is um, I, I'm now using a, a fair bit for my um, ultralight instruments. Um, and this was, I don't know how many um, hundreds of hours of brainstorming and prototyping um, and trying, I think, numerous different methods. Um, um, one of the things we're trying to solve is just the floppy neck problem. When you loosen it, how do you still get the, the sense that it's, it's got integrity, it's not gonna break, it's not gonna fall apart. And the other is how to blend the aesthetics. Um, so um, this is another view there. The player can put an Allen key in there and with about, you imagine this is a clock face um, with about a five minute rotation, it'll, it'll change the string heights by about half a millimeter. So it's, it's, it's very, very doable, it's very quick. And this similarly will change the side to side inclination. Um, and I, what I've been doing lately is putting a little mark at the center of the fingerboard at the end so the player can view it, the center between the strings and then you know, keep track of, of, of what's going on. So what I'd like to show is um, just the mechanism and, and Lonnie Mar Marino is our, our um, in-house um, whiz for digitizing and, and CNC work, um, put together this, um, these, these renderings. So um, one of the considerations with a neck like this is without a button, what happens if it comes unglued? Is it gonna like break the ribs? Um, and I had an earlier one with a more or less normal block and it did come unglued and nothing broke, but it gave me a very queasy feeling. So we tried a, a lot of different things. One was putting the grain going sideways instead of the normal vertical, the way they would in the guitar. Um, that's hard, a lot harder to carve because you can't just chip it out. Um, and it's weaker in the other direction. So what we've ended up doing is, is doing, it's, it's maybe about um, no deeper than a normal block, but it just goes side to side. And on that back edge, there is a, a maple, a plain maple about a millimeter thick. And on, on this inside surface is another um, veneer of plain maple going at 90 degrees to the block directly. So what you've got is a very rigid, virtually unsplittable um, block, which which makes me feel much more relaxed about the long term prospects of this. So um, there's only a small number of parts. They're 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 all um, 3D printed out of brass. Um, this one is just sort of a, a face plate with two holes in it that will that will um, take the force of the adjustment screws that goes in. Um, so that's that from above. There you can see the the veneer on the back. That's the brass part. The veneer on the front. And because that crosses this line, there is, no, there is no line where the block can split. And we also do this at the lower block for different reasons. Um, lower blocks do split over time. The, the wedging action of the, um, um, of, of the end pin can do that. So I, I see no reason to, to al allow that when it can be prevented by uh, relatively simple means. Um, now, this hole out um, is, you'll see it's gonna, is, is how we stabilize it without string tension. There's a pin that goes through, um, but let me just show you the pictures. So that's a, a four millimeter brass tube um, or a five millimeter brass tube. Yeah, no, four millimeter brass tube with a, um, with a hollow machined um, inner diameter that goes in there. And we have our one that goes there. That's just a threaded insert for the, for the adjustment screw. So um, you have a top hole, which is unthreaded and a bottom hole that's threaded. Now, the, the, the neck is milled with the spline and there's this little slot here, which is an alignment thing that fits into another brass part you'll see shortly. We have another uh, spline that fits in it. The, this has got some holes milled in it already. And then we have another little part there. That's a brass tube that, and that's got a threaded that's threaded down its center. On the outside, the playing face, the, the, the hole is drilled there. And then we put a, um, 
excuse me, a carbon fiber tube in it. And that's just so you can, it looks finished. And when you're finishing the neck, it doesn't chip inwards and it gives, it gives a nice professional look to it. And then that's just a little brass washer that the adjustment screw is gonna sit on. And this is the, the second or the third 3D printed part. Um, and that fits in there. And so this has two holes, two threaded holes into which um, a pointed set screws are, are going to go coming. They're gonna screw in that way. And that, that mates with the um, other side. And so what this is, is a, um, like, I think a millimeter and a half um, steel spring. And we thread that and we screw it in to there. And then, um, so this is essentially what you see or what's the mechanism in the end is that this is a um, M2.5 Allen head screw. And that goes into the brass insert on the other side. So the whole thing is pretty much like that. And all that's holding it together is, well, mainly string tension, but also this screw here. Now, if you, um, if you remove the string tension, that, that steel spring still goes through and that gives it a, a, a pretty firm feel. If it's unstrung in, in the shop, it, it, it feels good. It's not, it feels like it's not gonna fall apart. You, you can feel a bit of give to it. Um, we tried you know, various methods, God knows. We, we had a couple of instruments where we had a, a cork face glued in there and that gave it a nice bit of spring too, but then replacing the cork, taking it apart was more complicated. What I really like about this is um, it's, um, it can come apart immediately, go back together immediately. I'll show you when, when I finish these slides here. So it involves three pieces of 3D printed in brass. The total cost of those might be, be $30. Um, a couple of the three screws, some four millimeter brass tube, which um, Alex then lathes out the um, interior and, and threads. And um, I think a millimeter and a half stainless steel spring wire, it might be two millimeters, don't remember. And also some um, carbon fiber tube. So all it's all very accessible. Um, and then th that's um, again, what it looks like on the outside. So let me, let me just stop sharing the screen and um, the view for a minute. Well, okay, so here is a, this is a, a viola, it's a bit easier to see. And I've taken the screw out. I just want to show you, it comes apart. Um, so um, I would be comfortable with this, um, you know, if it ever came into any other shop telling them what to do, they could see inside, all the parts are visible. Um, um, I could send a spare part. I mean, if it was one of the brass parts. So I, I feel it's something that I don't think there's going to be a stampede in the field to move towards adjustable next, but um, I feel it is a fairly well resolved design and I'm, I'm certainly more than willing to share it with other people and, and um, would be delighted if anyone else uses it. And um, I will continue, we'll continue um, refining as necessary. But we've, um, the, these so-called ultralight instruments have a lot of different innovative aspects, but I think the, the next set I, is the one that now worries me the least. I, I, I really, um, I, I feel that it, it's working pretty well. So I will leave it at that. And if anyone has any questions, Thank you so much to Anthony and to Joseph uh, for his amazing presentations and uh, very appreciative. A big thank you to you for the, the, the fantastic work you're doing with the MBA. Bravo.